Welcome to This Week in South Carolina, I'm Gavin Jackson. February is Black History Month, and after the tumultuous events of 2020, there is much to talk about. We speak with Morel Johnson of Empower SC about the future of the social justice movement. But first, USC professor and director of the Center for Civil Rights, History, and Research, Dr. Bobby Donaldson, tells us about our past. Professor Donaldson, thanks for joining me. Glad to be with you. So, Professor, I want to start by talking about the history of Black History Month, which goes back to 1976, when President Gerald Ford urged Americans to, quote, seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history, quote. Uh, how big of a need is there still for people to understand black history now more than ever? I think it's an ongoing need. You know, what happened in 1976 was when Black History Month was declared a month-long observation. But you should note that there was a longer struggle to make this inclusion uh, impactful. One of the or early organizers of what is now Black History Month was a phenomenal scholar named Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who created what was called Negro History Week in 1926. And what Dr. Woodson understood was that there was a real vacuum, a real void, about the important role of African Americans in shaping and building the nation. And so he developed his own curriculum. He traveled around the country and went to schools and churches and Masonic lodges and began to teach a history that was often not discussed and not um, underscored in schools. And ironically, one of the people who helped him in that endeavor was a South Carolinian. Her name was Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. Uh, Dr. Woodson's organization was called the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. And uh, Dr. Bethune, a native of Sumter County, was the president of that organization in 1937. And she said, we should teach history at every grade level, from kindergarten to elementary, to high school, to college, to the grade. And we should do so at whatever cost. It is our obligation and our sacred duty. And so that, that motivation, that inspiration has carried Black History Month to where we are now. Now, what Dr. Dr. Woodson argued uh, that he saw that there should not simply be a Black History Month, that he envisioned a time when it may not be needed, that there would be indeed inclusive history every day, uh, all year. And, and part of the work we do at the University of South Carolina um, in the History Department of African American Studies and the Center for Civil Rights History and Research is to give teachers the tools they need to develop an inclusive curriculum that they can teach every day, all year. Mm -hmm. And that kind of maybe answers my question a little bit there. When we maybe hear from some people who say, why do we still need a month dedicated to black history? And I guess the answer there is that it should be in integrated more into the history books that we teach uh, children and up through adulthood. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think I'm not calling for an end of African American History Month. What I'm saying is that it becomes a launching pad that we can do a deep dive into important aspects of our nation and our state's history that are often overlooked. Um, and this is that window of time when you can get a sense of the lay of the land and figure out, you know, what do you do in March, April and May and June and all through the rest of the year? Because there is such a rich and extraordinary history of our state that still needs to be fully documented and fully told uh, to all citizens. And it was interesting because I was doing research on Black History Month and I and my alma mater, Kent State, I didn't I didn't know this till I read about it, was one of the first places to start celebrating Black History Month in 1970, which I thought was uh, really fascinating there because it, it started there and then six years later became a national a national thing. I want to talk about integrating more history into history books there, Professor. And it seems like we kind of go from, you know, okay, here's Harriet Tubman, here's Frederick Douglass, fast forward to Rosa Parks. I mean, is are history books getting any better when we look at like elementary, high school teaching? Obviously, when you get to college level, things can get a little bit more nuanced. You can learn a lot more. But are, are we seeing better integration into history, into, you know, how African Americans helped shape this country today? The answer is yes. I think there is there has been an, an active and um, an intentional effort to revise a lot of the longstanding history, traditional things that have been largely incorrect or have been misconstrued. Um, so when students come to the university and they take my intro U.S. history course, they do come a little more, um, not always excited about history, by the way, but at least more informed about history. And I do believe that um, there is still a real need to tell a more inclusive and comprehensive story. Uh, particularly as it relates to South Carolina. So you just mentioned Frederick Douglass, and I suppose most visitors can tell us one or two things about Frederick Douglass, but few can probably tell you about one of his colleagues, 
whose name was Joseph H. Rainey. Well, who is Joseph H. Rainey? Joseph H. Rainey is the first African-American elected to the United States House of Representatives from South Carolina. He was from Georgetown. Uh, and only now are we beginning to understand the extraordinary career uh, that he led uh, in the Reconstruction era. Uh, you mentioned Harriet Tubman. Well, some may not know about a woman named Celia Dow Saxon, a local teacher in Columbia who taught for 55 years, who advocated for the teaching of Black history in the 1920s and 1930s. And so the more we dig, the more we know. The more we dig, the more we realize what we do not know. And so that's, again, why I think having months like this and the work that is happening uh, across the country is so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, always discovering new things. And, and you wrote about uh, Congressman Rainey in the Smithsonian Magazine recently as well. Uh, come on, elaborate on that a little bit and talk about Reconstruction. You know, there, I've, I've been watching so many great documentaries on Reconstruction, and I just feel like it's just been a void uh, that I didn't know much about. I feel like we always talk about, you know, first black person for such office since Reconstruction, but I feel like we never really talk about Reconstruction. Uh, is there a, just a greater need for that? Why do you think that is? And, and where do you feel like that falls into the history books, essentially? I think an important component of Reconstruction is to challenge the long-standing notions that this was some sort of abysmal failure. That's been the biggest takeaway of Reconstruction for the longest of times, and that it was a kind of corrupt, corrupt moment in American history, as though it was the only moment where there was corruption. Um, but part of the important story about Joseph Rainey was here was a gifted leader who was well-equipped, well-able to govern, was viewed as one of the smartest men serving in Congress, black or white, and yet he has been relegated to a footnote in the history. I actually describe him as one of the founding fathers. He helped to rebuild South Carolina in the aftermath of Reconstruction. He helped to put forward a very progressive state constitution in 1895. And so it's ironic, Gavin, that here in South Carolina, there is, there is a monument on the grounds of the State House of South Carolina to Benjamin Tillman, who challenged Reconstruction. But there is no monument, there is no statue honoring Robert Small, so honoring Joseph Rainey. And yet again, I think these conversations really remind us of a need to, to, to delve more deeply into the history so that we can have a more complete story. And so now with the Joseph Rainey history coming to light, uh, there are now efforts to rename a Georgetown uh, County post office after Joseph Rainey. There is now a room in the United States Congress named for Joseph Rainey. But here was a man elected 150 years ago who's only now getting the type of credit and attention uh, that he deserves. Mm -hmm. Like you said, not not the only one there, too. I want to talk about, since you brought up monuments, I want to talk about the role of Confederate monuments. Obviously, it's been a very hot topic. I was down in Marion Square last year when John C. Calhoun's statue was removed. Uh, Tell me about this debate. You don't have to tell me, you know, we don't get too political on it. I just want to know what, you're, what you'd say to people when they say, you know, are we erasing history when we're taking down monuments? Obviously, the history still stands. A monument is uh, just a public monument to that history. But uh, elaborate on that for folks who say you're whitewashing history. You're getting rid of these things from history. Uh, what's your response to that? Well, first, I say I'm a professor of history. I've studied this a great deal. My roots are in South Carolina. My great-great-grandfather, whose name was Alex Williams. Alex Williams served from 1861 to 1865 in the Confederate Army. He was a Negro. He was a servant to a white man from Aiken County. He received a pension for being in the Confederate Army. And so I come at this very biased, um, but I believe that each monument should be, should be scrutinized. Um, and each monument should be scrutinized to the degree to which they tell a complete history. Um, I've kind of evolved over time. Initially, I was of the mind that you kind of strike a balance. But I do believe there are some monuments that deserve to be removed and put elsewhere. They do not deserve to be on the grounds of a state house. But if we do come to a com compromise that they deserve, they will stay there, then tell the whole history. A classic example is a name I just mentioned a moment ago, Benjamin Tillman. Well, when you read the monument, if you are a fifth grader coming in from um, Clarendon County or coming in from Lamar, South Carolina, you read that statue, you get a very skewed history of Ben Tillman. You, you, don't, you don't see anything that says that he was one of the leaders of the Hamburg massacre, a terrorist overtaking of a black community. You don't read anything about the fact that he championed lynching, that he championed disfranchisement. So again, if you want a statue to stand, tell 
a complete history of the individual. So is that something? What, if you don't want that sorry. complete history to be told. Remove it. So was that as simple as maybe putting uh, you know informational panels near a, a monument or of the like, or explaining more fully to describe who this person really is and, and their whole history? I believe so. Mm -hmm. I believe that's that's needed. That's needed if the monument is taken down or not. Um, I mean, we have we have a heritage act in place right now. It's a very difficult law to undo that was done intentionally. Uh, there is, of course, efforts to challenge the legalities of the act. But even if the act is in place, I still believe as an educator, as a historian, we have an obligation to review each of these to make sure we're telling the truth about a moment, about a place, or about an individual. And if we're not doing that, we're giving a, a skewed history to our students who see the state house grounds as not simply um, a place of governance, but it's a classroom. Mm -hmm. And if it's a classroom, we should be telling uh, an honest history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with several uh, depictions of John C. Calhoun in the State House as well. Uh, just to talk about the events of last year further, uh, how do you how did you put the events we saw unfold last year as a result of the death of uh, you know George Floyd and just a multitude of other incidents happening? How do you, how did you put this into context for your students and maybe how do you put it into context for people who who saw it one way or they they saw it as riots and not as protests even though they were majority peaceful protests? How, how did how does that mesh with our history and how we've gotten to this point. I mean, it seems like sometimes progress, unfortunately, for black Americans is either coming at the end of a, of a barrel of a gun or at the knee on the back of someone's neck or, or a baton. And, and how does this mesh in this moment with what we've seen in the past? Well, what I remind my students and even my own children who are 14 and 10 is that what we are witnessing and seeing is not a new phenomenon. It's part of a long trajectory of push and change and struggle and push back and resistance. But the brutal murder of George Floyd, I described as an Emmett Till moment. Well, who is Emmett Till? A 14-year-old boy tragically killed in Monday, Mississippi in 1955. It would have been an ordinary death, just like Floyd, if not his mother decided to show his brutally beaten body to photographers. And it was transmitted around the world. And for the first time, many people living in small towns around the country saw the impact, the literal impact, the brutality of segregation, of white supremacy and injustice. There was an awakening moment that this is a nation that we, that does not jive with our professed ideas of democracy and justice. Similarly, with George Floyd, here, this young man, life is taken away on camera. And in a moment where we're all sheltering in place, we see it. And we see it and see it and see it again. And for a lot of people, it was an awakening. There had already been protests and stories about police brutality. But now, average Americans are seeing it for themselves. And it was an awakening. And I think it galvanized people. It mobilized people. Um, and people took to the streets to protest. Um, ironically, there were a lot of protests on the grounds of the State House of South Carolina. Some of them I attended. Um, and I was, I'm there both as a champion and also as a witness and a, as a, a kind of a, a anthropologist, because part of what I'm reminded about is just that legal ability to gather on the grounds of the state house is um, endorsed and affirmed by events that happened in South Carolina. So, for example, 60 years ago, March 2nd, 1961, 300 African-Americans and supporters are on the grounds of the state house of South Carolina. They're marching around initially in silence. Then they, then they start singing and dancing freedom songs. They're all arrested for disturbing the peace. They are tried and they're convicted, 190 of them. And of those 190, one includes James Clyburn. The arrest of those people leads to a famous Supreme Court case called Edwards versus South Carolina. And the United States Supreme Court in an eight to one decision said it was unconstitutional for those persons to be arrested on public grounds when they're engaged in peaceful protests. Well, that landmark decision um, was is a law, is a ruling that enables much of what we see now. And yet very few people realize that what we enjoy today is built on the historical struggles of people who took to the streets, who demanded justice 60 years ago. 
So much we still need to learn. I wish we had more time to keep talking, Professor, but I thank you for joining us. That's Professor Bobby Donaldson. He's a professor of history and the director of the Center for Civil Rights History and Research at the University of South Carolina. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Joining me now to discuss the social justice movement in South Carolina is Morell Johnson. He's the chief strategy officer at Empower SC. Morell, thanks for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. So tell us a little overview before we get into more details about the movement in South Carolina. Just give us an overview about Empower SC and what you guys are hoping to accomplish in the state. Um, well, that's a great question. We, you know, last year, we, we all saw what happened with the George Floyd situation. It was what I would describe as a traumatic event. And out of that came a lot of protest, a lot of strife, a lot of trauma. And we all put our heads together as a collective in South Carolina to really work to make change, not only... Um, not only on a, a protest level, but also on a policy level. And um, we had a great group of people come together and work really hard to create a new policy and draft proposals and just really come up with some other options that we wanted to present to different municipalities and state legislatures to um, get them to think a little bit outside the box about how they do things. And if that's going to be continue to be our, our focus this year. That's going to be something that we're going to continue to push for. It's not dead. It's still very much alive and, and well, and um, we're going to continue that. Movement. This year, we um, actually had our strategy meeting last week, and we, we said there were a couple of things that we wanted to continue to focus on. Um, police brutality, of course, is front and center. Um, Health care and human services is also another one of those, um, those areas that we're focusing on, and also any other area that we, we identify that specifically targets individuals who are black or indigenous people of color and or women who are underserved and might need some type of equity or, or justice, so to speak. So that would look like things like um, um, food desert. Um, that would also look like something to the effect of um, incarceration rates, recidivism, recidivism after incarceration for black males who are coming out of a, a prison. Um, and the work is just a lot and it's very hard and we, we're just grinding and keeping our, keeping our head to the ground. So, Murrell, kind of tell me about how um, the, the need for this organization, right? Because we did see such an outpouring. It was such a tumultuous year. Everyone experienced it last year. Uh, and there was just such energy and momentum we saw here, especially in Columbia, across the state. Um, was there just not a group really steering that all that energy and momentum and you guys saw a need to do so? I mean, we, yeah, there, I felt like there was a lot of different organizations going on, but it seems like you guys are now out here still trying to make sure that something comes out of that movement. Well, you know, Gab, I'm, there have been groups doing this for a long time. Power is, there's nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that a lot of people might have just noticed it for the first time. And so they didn't realize how many actual organizations or groups or collectives were doing something. Um, but what we all saw in May, I want to make very clear, it was multiple organizations putting their heads together to come together. This is not something that any of us can do in a silo. And, um, and I'm very thankful for that. It would be very hard to be able to carry as much weight um, as, as we're carrying without having multiple parties involved. Mm -hmm. So now when we look at the issues you're talking about here, what specific issues are you all pushing for this year? We've seen some movement in the state house on some, on some legislative items, but uh, what specifically are you guys hoping to accomplish at the legislative level? Well, we're still gonna be pushing our policy to um, have um, our legislatures look and our city council and our account, county representatives look at um, rebudgeting how and refunding is the term we're using. We don't use the term defund because that's not an accurate representation and we have never used the term defund. Um, but we will be talking with them and working with them to see how we can assist in reallocating funds in areas that might be more beneficial in the communities they serve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, are you worried about that? I mean, when we look at that protest movement, when we look at how the messaging kind of got a little um, I guess difficult to get a little convoluted out there when we're talking about defunding police and what that really means versus actually trying to uh, make policing better in, in communities. Uh, what do you respond? What's your response to folks who kind of feel like the movement got twisted around or that it focused on the wrong things instead of the actual uh, need to accomplish some equity? You know, I, I, <laughs> I try not to, to get involved. I know we've had some politicians get, you know, very loud about saying, we use the wrong term. I don't believe that to be true because I'm a fact-based person and data-based per per person, and I don't see the data to back up that, that claim. Um, I do know that it can be confusing if you don't use the right term. I am a person who works in communications, and I understand that what you say matters, 
And I think that's a very valuable thing that we need to put our energy into, which is why, again, we never use the term defund. Refund was what we always wanted to say on purpose. And so when we do hear people say that, we just give them a gentle nudge in the right direction and, and just correct them and let them know what, what it's really about. Mm -hmm. And like we we're talking about movement at the legislative level, we did see uh, House Speaker Jay Lucas create the House Equitable Justice System and Law Enforcement Reform Committee last July as a result of everything happening in the country and in our state. Um, we did see legislation from that committee was introduced on the first day of the legislative session in January, and we're talking about bills that deal with asset forfeiture, uh, crime, uh, hate crime penalty enhancements, and also sentencing reforms. Uh, where does Empower SC fit into moving forward with these these bills? Do you all support these bills? And what do you want to see happen uh, with these? Well, there are some that we are we are very happy to get behind and support and, and applaud. And there are some that um, definitely need a little bit more tweaking and a little bit more oil before we can get behind that and make that something we're really happy to say that um, our movement, probably the social pressure, has pushed our legislature to do. Um, one, one area I think we really, really need to focus on, again, is just making sure um, that all of our police across the entire state are singing from the same sheet of music. And we don't have that right now. And so what you see is, you know, policing in Columbia looks completely different than policing in Charleston. And that's very, very important for us in order to make sure that, you know, when things hit publicly, there is no confusion about what happened or why people are being treated differently. Mm -hmm. And when we look at policing in the big cities versus maybe the rural areas in our state, uh, what kind of what kind of differences do you see there? And do we need more reforms in the bigger cities, or are the reforms more needed in the smaller areas, the smaller departments? Uh, what's the take on that from Empower SC? From, from our vantage point, it, it, I mean, we know that based on rural communities, their funding is completely different than bigger cities, and so we understand that that is something that needs to be worked on, but. To answer your question directly, who needs it more? It's kind of like saying, you know, do you want the, the top half of the baby or the bottom half of the baby? And we're not trying to split that at all. We Together, we want to work to make sure that everyone gets everything that they need and so that the community can benefit the best. And obviously, this is, you know, the first Black History Month since last year uh, when we did see so much, you know, upheaval. Uh, both good and bad, of course. But how do you feel things are different right now? How do you see things moving forward? Do you feel like this movement is still energized at this point? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we get a lot of messages and a lot of questions daily asking about different aspects of, of our movement. We have a lot of questions asking if we can hop in and like maybe help promote something and, and really get behind a specific individual. Things I mean, we, we know that the, the world has changed forever. I mean, we just cannot deny that fact. And you have some people who will say that our community is now more divided than ever, and you have some who will say that our community is more united than ever. Um, over the next couple of years, we're going to be looking at really trying to, to make unity happen, but we also want it to be done in a fair and equitable way. And talk about equity. That was something I wanted to talk about. Uh, you know, it seems like it's almost becoming weaponized right now politically. Some people are saying, you know, equity is, is some sort of way of, uh, you know, discriminating against one population versus another, even though these populations have been historically discriminated against, leading to inequity. Uh, what, what is your approach to how we can be more equitable as a society and maybe address those who see it as some sort of discriminatory practice? Um. You know, I, I think that in order to address equity, we have got to address the true definition of why equity is something that we need. Um, and that is a very difficult conversation to have for a lot of people. And it is a very uncomfortable conversation for people to have. Um, so with that being said, I will go back to, to what I've been saying from the very beginning. We need to start by listening. Um, listen to different groups and get a very diverse surrounding around um, personally and on a professional level so that you can just absorb like a sponge everything that's being said and everything that's being done. And you you can hear it, you can see it, you can feel it. Um, and then only then, once you start from the very ground and clear your mind and just have a very open perspective on the world around you, the environment around you, then you can move forward. And then, Meryl, with just about two minutes left, a minute left here, I want to ask you about um, what y'all are doing in order to listen to folks. I mean, uh, obviously, we don't want to have to have to wait for another tragedy to inspire people to do something. You're saying the movement's still alive and very well. I want to know uh, how people can get involved, what they should be doing if they want to keep that movement alive, how they can address these issues on their own. Right. Um, well, um, on, on a personal level, we are saying the same thing we've always been saying. Have these conversations in spaces where 
the minority is not there and push back against it. That's very, very important. You have no idea how heavy word of mouth is until you actually have these conversations with your family members and your friends. Another thing we're saying is that if you want to be, join a movement, you know, feel free. It doesn't take very much energy to do. You can just hop in and say, hey, what can I do to participate and be part of the chain? Or can you help me find some resources where I may not necessarily be very um, knowledgeable in so that I can become better? And it's a very easy conversation to have. And it can be a very tough pill to swallow when you realize just how small your world really is. Mm-hmm. Well, gotcha. Well, Morel Johnson, with Chief, the Chief Strategy Officer at Empower SC, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. For the latest South Carolina news, check out the South Carolina Lead. It's a podcast I host multiple times a week, and you can find it anywhere you find podcasts, including SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org. For South Carolina ETV, I'm Gavin Jackson. You all, South Carolina.